Hello and welcome to Why Did They Wear That? The show that explores the reason why people wore that through history. In today's episode, we'll be exploring the history of the beret. From its humble beginning as a hat worn at the foot of the Pyrenees by communities since the Middle Ages, to being associated with the French and Spanish lower classes, to becoming a symbol of artists, military power, and social unity. The beret is more than a stereotype, it's a powerful symbol that can be used by anyone to enact an idea. Let's dive into why people wore the beret. Beret-esque felted hats have been worn throughout the ages, with examples being worn by the Macedonians in the 4th century BC, called the Chalcia, where after travelling to eastern Persia and the Indus Valley, they brought the cap back with them. They are similar to the modern Pakol and Sichal found in Afghanistan. Hi, so editing Leah, I just wanted to clarify what I'm trying to say in terms of the Calcia and its links to the beret. So the Calcia is brought back with the Macedonians in Alexander the Great's campaign through Persia and it is picked up somewhere in the Indus Valley and is brought back to Greece and back through to the empire that Alexander has got and from there it then travels both down into the west so down into the Basque region um, where it then becomes the beret and then it also goes back into the east where the modern Pakol is based. So the Calcia is kind of the precursor both to the modern beret and also the modern Pakol, which I think is really cool and doesn't take away from the fact that it is a different hat, but it's kind of like where it began and its origin. So thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of the video. These caps did have a similar connotation to the beret with its associations with military power, suggesting that felted caps worn by the military were a simple way to unify a group. We find it tricky to actually identify when the beret became the beret because there's been so many examples of it being worn throughout time. Just as we mentioned, the Calcia, the Tam O'Shanter of Scotland, the Pakol and Chital from Asia and the beret from the Pyrenees. We also have examples of a beret, but not a bass beret, being worn through the 14th to 16th centuries. Even Henry VIII wore a beret. During the Renaissance, we have a beret being worn. It is a lot larger and floppier, became popular with artists such as Rembrandt, nobility and, and aristocrats. It was associated with intelligence, responsibility and artistry. Just like any garment, it fell out of fashion and faded to only being worn by peasants and artists. The reason for this garment to be heavily associated with artists is because of its egalitarian style. It is cheap to make and it is foldable, so it's very easily transported. It is moldable, so you can change the size of it and it will fit any head. And because of it being felt, it is very waterproof. So it can be worn to keep your head warm, to keep you dry, and to add, a, you know, a little bit of pizzazz to your life. And because of its connections with the lower class, and generally artists weren't very affluent, so they're most likely coming from agricultural backgrounds or from places where a beret would be common to be worn. It's also easy to produce because to make felt, all you need is either a woven textile or just the hair itself, which then can be matted into the garment. Let's put this back on. The origin of the French beret, or its more technical term, the Basque beret, since it's the most common type in production now, 
Uh, it's like the one I'm wearing on my head. It's got the classic stalk. It can be moldable in any shape you want it and it can come in any color you want. The definition from the Encyclopedia of Clothing states, a berry is a round, flat, visorless cap worn by both sexes over the centuries. Berries are made of circular pieces of knitted, woven or felted cloth, occasionally velvet, and is drawn underneath by a string, thread band or leather thong, so as to fit around the head. It goes on to explain the origin of the Basque style, which associates the beret with the Basque people of the Pyrenees mountains. Thus, why it's called a Basque beret. There is a lot of confusion about the origin of the Basque beret, since there are two communities that claim to be the founders. The first being, of course, the Basque people, who are linked to the shepherds who wore them on the mountains when herding their flocks. And they also have a very strong connection to the Basque Beret now with their traditional dress and a lot of people in the region wearing a Basque Beret, especially Basque people. The Basque people are an isolated group whose culture, language and history is not like any other Indo-European community due to them being locked off by the Pyrenees Mountains. This meant that they developed separately from their neighbouring countries, France and Spain. So the hypothesis is that they developed the beret in the mountains whilst tending their sheep, as felt is a simple and basic material that can be created with just a bit of wool. It is knitted or matted straight away into a disc, which then can be moulded into a beret. The other people that claim to be the founders are the Bernard's people who are from the same area of France, but are not Basque. The reason it wasn't called a Bernard's beret is because of Napoleon III, who called the beret a Basque beret when he came to visit the area. Obviously being the emperor of France, nobody really wanted to tell him that he was wrong. So from that, it meant that the Basque beret became the term used because nobody corrected anyone. I'm not sure which one is correct, but it's really important to note that the Basque beret is an integral part of the Basque people's culture now. And even if they're not the original producers, they are still an important part of the Basque beret. Berets are crafted out of a felted fabric which is then moulded to the head to create a bubble-like shape. Being a versatile hat, it can be worn in different styles with great effect. For example, you can wear it over one ear, you can wear it at the front like that, you can wear it in a halo style at the back, or you can just kind of wear it atop the head. It's so versatile as a hat because it's so moldable. Felt is considered one of the oldest fabrics that humans have utilized other than hides and furs, with evidence of it being used in 6,000 BCE, so roughly 8,000 years ago. Felt is traditionally made out of animal hair because at a microscopic level, animal hair has a scaly surface. When moistened, it causes the fibres and the scales to stick up, which have little hooks on them, which then mean when hair is pressured and put together, it will then lock into one mass that becomes felt. There are two types of felt. The first being fibre felts, made directly from animal fibre. The second being woven felt, which takes the fibre, either animal or man-made, makes them into a yarn or string. It is then woven into the product, which is then mattified and felted. The reason that we have these two types is because animal hair is able to, to create those links firsthand, whereas synthetic fibers aren't able to mattify without being woven. So the weaving helps encourage the felting process. Both methods produce an indistinguishable product from one another, so neither is better than the other. In construction, the bass berry is woven and is primarily made from wool. 
but it can sometimes be made out of other materials. The commercial production of the Basque Barret began during the 17th century in Orlon saint marie which is located at the foot of the Pyrenees Mountains. By the 19th century, industrial production was introduced. Botex Lodrel claimed to be the first factory having started production in 1810. Over 20 factories were producing millions of barrets for the international market by 1928. The lengthy but simple process of constructing a Basque Barret first starts with the fibre being knitted into a galette or a pancake from woolen yarn. Nowadays, this is done by machine. The loosely woven pancake is then washed in cold water and detergents, which felts it causing the cap to shrink and become soft. The freshly felted galette is then dyed to the desired chaise and goes through quality checks for colour quality. Through the use of metal forms, the beret is formed into its classic beret shape. Originally, this was done on the knee, then on a wooden form, and then now on a metal form. The beret will rest on this form until it's able to retain its shape. The beret will go through a scratching machine which will remove any desired plant material or fiber. A cardboard template is then inserted into the hat to maintain its shape, whilst the cap is sheared around the stalk. The stalk is traditionally where the beret was first started when knitted by hand. Think of a knitting project and the first few stitches being there as an anchor point. Now the stalk is left as a homage to the older method of construction. A lining is heat moulded to fit inside the shape of the beret, which is then stitched down. The beret is stretched to the required hat size, where a leather band is added to maintain the shape and to keep its size. This is also where any details can be added to the cap. After this, it is packaged and is ready to be sold and worn by a fashionista a soldier or an intellectual. The beret has been a symbol for so many throughout the ages. Earlier in the video, I mentioned that the beret has had connections to the art movement and intellectuals, being the hat of choice for so many artists such as Rembrandt, Picasso and Monet. To wear a beret is like a badge of honour for an artist, a way to connect to other artists throughout the ages and to experience their idols through the cap. Now it's cemented in everyone's head, an artist wearing a beret, a white coat or overalls, a large paint palette and an easel. I'd say the art connection has now started to shift over into the textile and fabric movements, but anyone especially artists, will wear a beret to show and symbolise themselves being a creative. The beret is unlike any other item. It has been a part of our wardrobes for centuries. It is a staple now. Its availability and its ability to be produced cheaply has ensured it was always accessed and has kept the hat going and keep its longevity. Its mouldability, quite literally, ensured that it stayed a part of our wardrobes. By the 20th century, has become a staple within women's fashion. First as a sports hat worn in the 1920s, as it was so easily able to emulate the cloche style, then carried forward into the 1930s and 1940s. Coco Chanel is first attributed to having the beret being worn down the catwalk. Especially during World War II, Wearing a beret was a sign of military unity and support of the war and ensuring that everyone felt a part of the war effort. As we make it to the 1950s, it is starting to be elevated in high fashion and it's been experimented with, with new fabrics, new shapes being used and utilised. It is becoming reinvented. By the 1960s, it starts being claimed by revolutionaries such as the Black Panthers, the IRA and the Cuban Revolution. Even though these groups claimed it, people that didn't associate these groups still wore it for fashion, for practicality and for comfort. Even now, 
in modern contemporary times, it is still being worn and is still loved by many. It is a timeless hat that gives the energy that you have something to say. It puts a message on your head. And I think that's really powerful. The military influence. Examples of early military use, such as the Scottish blue bonnets through the 16th and 17th century, and the sky blue bonnets of the Voltaire's Canterbrez, also known as the Royal Canterbrez Infantry in 1740s to the 1760s, who were from the Basque regions. Then the red berry of the Carlist rebels during the 1830s at the first Carlist war in Spain. By this 19th century, there is a beret takeover. In 1888, French Chaussures Alpines were the first permanent military group to assign the beret to their formal standard headdress. Then in 1924, royal approval was granted to the Royal Tank Corps to wear a black beret as part of their service dress. By the beginning of the Second World War, the beret had been adopted by several mechanised unit groups since the beret was practical to getting in and out of unit vehicles without it falling off. In 1942, the Maroon Beret was adopted to the 1st Airborne Division, which led to international association of the Maroon Beret with the airborne divisions across the world. Later in 1942, the commandos adopted the Green Beret as part of their uniform. Later in 1951, we have the adoption of the Green Beret by the US Special Forces. Now in 2023, the Beret is literally adopted by almost every nation's military force. As a cheap product to produce and its portability, it's no surprise that this has happened. Looking outside the military, the Beret is worn by many organized uniform groups, such as the police, the Scouts and the Brownies. The beret has become a symbol of both unity and of power, which is where we discuss its uses outside of, of the military and look at how the beret has been taken by different groups to be used as a unified message of revolution. From the previous sections, we explored the cultural and military influences the beret has had, but now, we need to talk about the revolutionary impact that the beret has had. It first starts in the 1830s with the Carlist rebels wearing a red beret as part of their uniform and as part of a revolutionary group. Then through the Second World War, the beret became associated with the French resistance. So Germany actually put a ban out on bass berets being worn by people. And if anyone was caught wearing a bass beret, they were sent to Nazi concentration camps or arrested and then sent to Nazi concentration camps. So the connection between resistance and the beret had become really strong by this point and by the 1950s and 1960s it became an actual symbol of revolution. One of the most infamous images of the beret actually comes from a revolutionary group. It comes from the Cuban revolutionaries by a specific man called Che Guevara, who was a Marxist who wore the beret in a infamous image where he has the beret in the centre, back with the badge right at the front, and underneath it will say revolution. But why, why the beret? Well, it's cheap, it's accessible, and because of its military connections, it's a really useful way an easy way to show that the group is militant, is organised and has power. The same thing happened with the Black Panthers. They donned the Black Beret. They were a African-American revolutionary rights group who took it upon themselves to protect them and African-Americans as they were African-Americans themselves from police brutality in America. I think the beret is an incredibly important garment to have and to wear and I think it became such a revolutionary item. As you can see the beret has been 
on a long journey with us, taking on the many connotations we have assigned to it. It is moldable, flexible, and can impart any message we want it to. It has become a part of our military identity, providing hundreds of military forces a cap that can be both practical and egalitarian. As a fashion statement, it nods to our thousands of years of history and sometimes something is just universal and will forever be timeless. The beret is one of them. Thank you for watching Why Did They Wear That and coming on the journey of the beret.